we're thrilled today to welcome Lisa Weiland, the CEO of Massport. Uh, she's going to join us. Um, our protocol is the same as they've been. We're going to do 30 minutes of questions between uh, Lisa and myself. Then we'll open up at the bottom of the hour for member Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll ask you to turn on your microphone and uh, you'll be able to ask Lisa questions directly. At two o'clock, we'll revert to our um, lightning round of questions. We'll finish with our message of hope and as always, a prompt adjournment at 2.15. So with all of that, Lisa and all of our members, thank you so much for joining us today. Warren, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join the BC CEO Club and thank you everyone uh, for joining today. It's delightful to connect uh, with all of you and to, to see many of you whom I've not seen for a long time. Yeah, and it, it really is great to see so many faces. I know that um, business has continued, but our group hasn't gotten together um, since November, pre-holidays. A couple of things have happened since then, um, but I'm really happy to, to have everyone back and to, to bring this community together again. I know that virtual does not replace our in-person events. We're hoping to, to get back together as soon as we possibly can at the Boston Harbor Hotel. But until then, we, we certainly want to continue to get together and, and gather. So again, with that, welcome to everybody. Um, Lisa, again, some, some basic questions to start off with, but it's, it was fascinating when I thought about Massport. Uh, you've been around since 1956, and the mission has been to connect Massachusetts and New England to the world. And so you, you're more than just Logan. Tell us a little bit about the entire um, umbrella that, that Massport encompasses. Sure. Uh, I think you know most people are familiar with, with Logan Airport because it's how we travel for business and, and pleasure. Um, but it is, it, is, it is the crown jewel, obviously, of our aviation business. But we also uh, operate Hanscom Field, which is New England's premier corporate jet facility and actually the second busiest airport in New England uh, by operations. Uh, and then we also operate Worcester Regional Airport, uh, which has been a growing part of our, our aviation portfolio. Uh, so that's our aviation business line. Uh, we also have a maritime division uh, that consists of Conley Container Terminal, uh, a cruise terminal, um, as well as we're the landlord for a number of seafood processors, as well as the Boston Auto Port uh, in Charlestown. And we're a little bit different than most ports in that we're an owner operator. We're not just a landlord port. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, we have a pretty sizable commercial real estate portfolio, uh, 9 million square feet already developed. Uh, with 3 million more under development. It includes things like uh, Fidelity's offices on Commonwealth Pier, Legal Harbor side, uh, the site where the Omni Hotel is going up, as well as uh, the recently announced partnership we have with uh, Lincoln Properties to develop uh, a, new, a new development on, on Parcel H. Um, and you know, the other thing that I would say uh, around our portfolio that some of you may know, but others may not, is although we are a public sector entity and we operate public assets, uh, we tend to operate a little bit more like a business. We generate our own revenue. Uh, mm -hmm. We issue our own bonds. Our bonds are not backed by the Commonwealth. We don't get any tax dollars per se uh, for our operating expenses. We're fortunate enough uh, to get some um, funding from the FAA for various grants. Uh, we've had some support from the Baker Polito administration for some of our port infrastructure. Um, and so we operate a little bit differently. Um, than, than some other public sector organizations. Um, and, and we think about what we do like a business. We have customers. Uh, some of our top customers are, are joining us today. Mr. Kraft and, and the Kraft family is one of our top exporters at Conley Terminal. Uh, and he's been incredibly supportive of the infrastructure investments we've made in the port, uh, as well as uh, some of the nonstop international services we've attracted at Logan over the years. It's, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, obviously, you're, at least I'll speak for myself and I won't speak for, for anybody else. My wife always reminds me, but you know, my, my first impression is always, you know, the Massport signs at Logan, right? But then as you start to, to look up the website and all the other things that you guys are doing and, and you know, you realize the, just the sheer volume and scope of what your company, your, your institution oversees, right? And, and then I was looking at the number of passengers and the tons of cargo through the port and the economic impact on the community. It really is remarkable the, the impact and again, the scope of, of everything that's under your purview. And you know, clearly 2020 was a little bit different for all of us. And I suspect that there were some, you know, certainly that there were less people at Logan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of how the pandemic hit financially your, your organization? 
Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, it came into this job uh, about six months before the, the pandemic started, and uh, we were managing explosive growth across all of our business lines. Uh, Logan was on track to do 45 million passengers. Uh, we had seen unprecedented growth, both in the leisure and, and uh, business market, international growth. On the port side, Conley Terminal was breaking records every every year. We were going to have a record-breaking cruise season, over 400 ships. Uh, so really, we were in this period of how do we manage uh, this explosive growth across every business line. Uh, we were on track to do a billion dollars in revenue um, and had you know, significant margin to be able to invest in some of the things that we wanted to do, like expand our HOV initiatives, mm -hmm. uh, like invest in new environmental uh, technologies that would help us to reduce our carbon footprint, as well as some of the things that we wanted to do in the community. Uh, so of course, uh, when the pandemic hit, um, uh, our business activity fell off a cliff. Uh, so at, at the lowest point, Logan was down 98% uh, back in April. Um, so what does that kind of mean in terms of activity, right? So on a typical day, we'd have about 1,300 um, uh, arrivals and departures at Logan. Uh, at the low point, we were, we were doing around 100. Um, in terms of passengers, uh, we were typically, you'd have 65,000 people going through TSA, uh, mm -hmm. departing from Logan every day. Uh, and we were down to, you know, around 1,000. Uh, where are we today? Uh, so we're still down about 70%, um, which is, is really, really a, a challenging place to be in. Um, you know, our revenues this year are on track to be about $540 million. Uh, so a significant drop off than what we were expecting. Um, and Logan tends to be a, an airport that is more impacted than others. Uh, if you look across the country, uh, they, we tend to be in the top five in, in terms of, um, I would say, business activity, uh, just because we're, you know, 40% of our travelers used to be the business traveler. 20% of our travelers were international. And right now, both of those customer segments are, are non-existent for the most part. Um, so we've, we've got a big financial challenge ahead of us. Uh, we're looking at about a $400 million gap uh, that we're trying to close over the next three years. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging time for the authority. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly hitting this industry really hard, right? Travel and, and entertainment and thinking about the ability to, to go visit on personal level for vacations, but also the business travel. And I, and I and I'm wondering sort of what extent business travel comes back since everyone's become proficient, or at least most people, I'll exclude myself, in, in Zoom and technology and, and using it. And so the question is, you know, in the old days when you'd fly down to New York for a two hour meeting, um, and I know that this doesn't replace that, but I'm always sort of interested in terms of what what will what will 2025 look like? Will the business travel come back to, to where it was? Or do we think that this is this is going to have a, a, a sizable impact long term? So, so I think that that is a, a key question, and, and obviously many of you uh, that are joining us today, uh, one of the, the things that I find value in is being able to hear from you about some of these things that we're trying to figure out so we can make sure that we're investing strategically uh, for the future. Um, from our perspective, business travel is going to be slow to come back. Leisure will come back before business, domestic before international. Um, and this industry doesn't work like a light switch. Right. I have a lot of conversations with people. We're all hopeful about um, vaccines and the vaccine um, allowing people to travel again. But it's not like we all of a sudden flip a switch and everything goes back to pre-pandemic levels from a, an aviation standpoint. Um, on the business front, you know, you, you kind of peel back the, the onion on, on the different segments of business travel. Um, you know, there are some things that, that are going to happen, right? If you're trying to close a deal and you're worried your competitor is going to, to take it from you, you're going to be on that plane. But the first time you lose that sale, you're going to be on that yep. plane. Uh, there are certain parts of the supply chain that you have to go visit, right? But, you know, uh, what we've heard from, from business leaders as we talk to them is that, you know, the, the internal corporate travel is probably not going to come back. You're probably not going to fly your employees around as much as you may used to for corporate training, for example. You'll rethink uh, that Boston to London two-hour business meeting, uh, right? And, and perhaps do it uh, uh, via Zoom or another platform. Um, conventions, right? So if you yeah. think about Logan um, and uh, the conventions that come here, that's, that's a, a big segment of business travel too that is going to be slow to come back. Um, so, but do we think it's, it's all going away? No, of course not. Uh, I just think that it's going to take it a little bit longer 
before we see the levels that we saw before. And I think that there was a Wall Street Journal article uh, that predicted somewhere between 19 and 36 percent of business travel uh, might be permanently lost. And I think somewhere in that is, is kind of consistent with our projections as well. Yep. That, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to me, just sort of a gut reaction that, you know, there certainly are business meetings that have to be done in person and those will continue to do so. Um, but there certainly will be some things and in, in, again, internal company stuff that, that may not. Um, I, I, I also sort of interested, I know your background is, was in the port. Has the port itself been, been impacted the same way um, or are you still sort of at close to capacity? Yeah, so the, the port's been a, a, an interesting um, uh, business for us. So obviously it was heavily impacted early on because factories shut down in China, ports shut down in China, and uh, Asia, Asia to Boston is one of our biggest trade lanes. Um, and so uh, we saw, you know, what I would say it's dramatic swings uh, in container volume early mm -hmm. on. That is stabilized. Uh, we were still down 8% uh, in 2020. Um, but when we kind of look out, uh, we're, we're confident that things are going to return to normal. They have, for the most part, stabilized. Uh, and the other thing that we're really looking forward to is um, uh, we've been investing significantly in modernizing Conley Container Terminal and dredging Boston Harbor. Yep. Uh, and so those projects are well underway. Uh, we'll receive our, our three new large cranes uh, that are being manufactured currently in Shanghai this summer. Uh, so we're very excited about the, the business potential uh, that that new berth and those cranes and the deep in Boston Harbor will bring uh, for our area's importers and exporters. That's great. Um, I know one of the, the areas that you focused on both sort of pre-pandemic, and I'm assuming it still is a priority, um, is Worcester Regional Airport. Tell us a little bit about sort of what's happening there and, and what you see as the future for, for that hub. Sure. So, you know, as, as Logan uh, gets increasingly busy, um, we, we knew we needed to have a regional aviation strategy, and Worcester was a, a critical part of that. And so we embarked on a 10-year strategy to... Uh, to really revitalize that airport and and you know there's a lot of investment happening in Worcester that was exciting and and uh, helped make uh, uh, the investments we were uh, we were putting into to the airport um, drive what we think were, were pretty good results uh, so pre-pandemic uh, we had five daily services uh, from JetBlue American and Delta uh, mm -hmm. with flights to Florida uh, Orlando and or Orlando excuse me for Lauderdale and Orlando uh, New York Detroit and Philadelphia. Uh, and it wasn't just about the, the destinations of Detroit, New York, and Philadelphia. It was about getting into those airlines hubs, and it was mm -hmm. where you could go from those cities. Uh, and so uh, we had just added two of those services within the past couple of years. Uh, and Worcester in 2019 had its best uh, passenger volume since 1993. So we were uh, over 195,000 passengers, uh, and things were, were really on track. Uh, of course, the pandemic changed things. Um, unfortunately, all those airlines had to, to drop service from Worcester. Uh, but the, I think the positive thing is, is they're all committed. They're all committed to restoring service uh, when the time is right. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just had uh, a great conversation uh, with JetBlue, uh, Joanna Garrity, who's their president, uh, as well as Congressman McGovern and Lieutenant Governor Polito, one of their leaders from Worcester on Friday to talk about JetBlue's commitment uh, and their plans uh, to bring back service hopefully later this year. Uh, and I think actually, Warren, you had um, Robin Hayes yeah. uh, as a guest who also reiterated JetBlue's commitment. Uh, so it remains an important part of our strategy. Uh, it's just going to take you know a little bit of time uh, for things to come back. There. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's fascinating to sort of watch what's happening out in Worcester and think about that as the alternative to, to going to Logan and the, joining the 65,000 passengers. And that it seems like they're all in line at, at TSA with me at the same time, but you know, such as such as travel. But but I I, I do recall um, you know our conversation with Robin over the summer, um, mm -hmm. vividly in the sense of his commitment and optimism about how quickly things would come back and how safe it was to travel today on on his his planes, but in general. And so um, it's not surprising that JetBlue has reached back out and their commitment to to Worcester and to the region. It's it's an important area for them and. Um, again, nothing but respect to, to Robin and his team. And as a reminder for anybody who's having any mosaic questions, he, he brought his, uh, his team onto our call. So we've got, we've got some backup there. Um, 
I, I want to shift our conversation quickly, um, knowing that we're going to open up to our members at around 1.30 for questions. Um, let yourself, if you have questions, go to the chat and uh, Lauren or Gail will, will help facilitate the timing of that. But um, I'm thinking about Massport and your sort of your, your investment in vi environmental sustainability and clean energy and, and climate change. These are things that that I've read about and you've talked about as being a priority for the organization. Can you tell us a little bit about some detail in terms of what that, that entails for, for Massport? Sure, so I think, you know, for, for a long time, we're very focused on, on trying to think about how do we reduce our emissions um, and what are the things that we can do that are within our control um, uh, to be able to have a positive impact for the surrounding communities. Uh, and so we, we've taken a number of actions over the years to reduce our environmental footprint. Uh, and they range in things from just making sure that, uh, you know, as we bring new buildings online, that they're uh, trying to attain the highest LEED certifications possible uh, to moving to electrify the ground service equipment, uh, which is the equipment that the airlines use airside. Uh, so we've embarked on, on a process to convert uh, all of those to um, electric powered vehicles. We've installed a number of electric charging stations uh, across the airport. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, um, uh, water usage and, and other sustainability initiatives that we have. We implemented a clean truck program associated with Conley Terminal, uh, where we helped truckers uh, replace their older model trucks with newer, cleaner uh, engine trucks. Uh, so we've, we've done a thing, a, a number of things. Um, Prior to the pandemic, I had launched a small little working group to think about um, how do we get to net zero um, and to start to put together a net zero roadmap, uh, not just for Logan, but for the entire authority. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I had hit the pause button uh, on that effort uh, when the pandemic hit, but we recently reinitiated uh, that effort uh, and are thinking about, okay, how do we, yes, our financial resources are different than I thought they might be, uh, but how do we still think about what does that roadmap look like and are there things that we can do to still be aggressive uh, and take advantage of you know, what, what we hear coming out of Washington, which is going to be an emphasis on uh, climate change and, and other initiatives that perhaps there's an opportunity to seek some federal funding to help us do what we wanna do. That's great. I mean, it's, it's clearly, I mean, the impact that your footprint has, um, again, we, you know, I, I don't need to sort of underscore it too much, but it's impressive. And so I would, I would suspect that even minimal changes that you would make across the board would have a significant impact on the climate and the environment and everything else. And so um, it's great that you have been and continue to be thinking about that. And hopefully, um, you know, you're in line with the government as, as, as stuff starts to come through with this administration. So um, that that's good. And another area that you guys have had a significant commitment in um, before it became the thing to talk about has been diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion. Um, it was exhibited in your Omni Hotel project. Uh, and then again, recently with the lease that, that came through um, recently in Seaport. Can you tell us just a little bit about why that is so important to Massport and to you? Sure, so um, I can't take credit for what's now being called the Massport model. Credit for that um, idea and concept goes to my predecessor, Tom Glynn and Dwayne Jackson, our former board member, who, who looked at the Seaport uh, and said, you know what, there's a lot of upside potential here and how do we ensure, you know, our role uh, as, as, as an economic engine is, is to, to try to ensure um, that, uh, you know, some of the upside is, is, is shared. And so how do we think about bringing, uh, at the time, diversity and inclusion, what I now say diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. to Massport's commercial real estate portfolio. And what we did, you know, frankly, at the time uh, was quite controversial. Uh, a lot of people said it was not going to succeed. Um, and so I give a lot of credit to Dwayne and Tom for saying, no, you know what, we think it can. And so let me just explain what we did. So uh, we, when we put our land out to market, um, you know, we, we put a parcel out, we give a little bit of a prescription around what we think it should be. And then we let the market kind of tell us what, what it should be. Um, and, and what we did was we said, when we are evaluating uh, these proposals, uh, we are going to set four equally weighted criteria. And one of those criteria was diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we weren't just going to judge uh, a developer's proposal based on the financial return to Massport. We weren't just going to um, evaluate it based on the concept uh, and how much we liked uh, what they were proposing, nor their ability to execute. Four equally weighted criteria. 
and um, the diversity of their team uh, was important. Um, and so that was the first project that that took place on was the Omni Hotel. Um, and the key piece was that um, uh, people had an equity stake, uh, mm -hmm. were able to, to uh, uh, obtain some equity in that project. And then we rolled out that mass court model for parcel A2 uh, and kind of took it to the next level. And then the award that you just mentioned uh, on parcel H with Lincoln Properties, we're, we're thrilled uh, with this new concept. Um, you know, not only did it, um, did this team put together um, joint ventures across every aspect of the development. So not just the construction, but the, the architecture, the management of the building, a whole bunch of pieces. Uh, they are also going to build a life science career training center uh, that will target underrepresented communities to help build a pipeline into the life science sector, which we all know is just, um, you know, uh, growing like crazy uh, in the area. So we're, we're really excited. Um, and it's part of the, the thing that I've committed to that we need to think about how do we, how do we advance this model? How do we continue to make sure that when we have economic impact, it's broad and it's deep uh, and that, you know, our, our resources are, are spent um, in an equitable way. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrific in a bunch of ways, right? First, that, that Massport, through its leadership, including your predecessors, as well as the board, said, this is important to us, and we're going to put our, our flag on the ground and say that this matters. But then also the recognition that, as and I, I see Carol Fulp is here, as, as we've heard over and over again, diversity is good for business, right? It's not just right because it should be done. There's value. Um, to the bottom line, to the ecosystem. And I think that what Massport is displaying is, is that very truth. And so I think that that's, that's been fantastic in, in to see the impact that it's had and the response that it seems to be getting um, has, has been powerful. Um, you know, in, in so many ways, Massport's been a good community partner. Um, you, you continue to, to foster that Feeling why why does that matter so much to to your organization? Yeah, so if you if you think about the footprint of, of any of our assets, be it Logan or Conley, um, we operate um, right in people's backyards, right, and we're very close to our neighboring communities, uh, and so it's it's always been important to us uh, that we do our best to be a good neighbor, uh, and whether that's trying to make investments in things that are going to reduce emissions or noise. Uh, whether it means we're going to partner with organizations like the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, mm -hmm. um, whether it's we, we have a charitable contributions program. And, and one of the things we decided to do this year was to actually set a target for the first time to say 40% um, of our giving has to go to organizations that predominantly serve people of color or are run uh, by people of color. Uh, and let's, let's set the target. Uh, we've never had a target before, and let's try to increase that target every year. Um, and, and so we, we like to work with a, a broad range of, of community organizations to, to invest where, where it makes sense. Um, and, you know, we end up hiring a lot of people from our neighboring communities as well. Uh, and so uh, it's, 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 it's a good relationship to keep and, and we work closely with our local elected officials uh, to think about how do, we, how do we be a good neighbor. And, and you know, one of the things um, that we've been um, focused on a lot is the green space as yeah. well uh, that we invest in. Yeah, and that's and that's a it's a perfect segue. Um, you know, you, you recently entered into a public-private partnership with the trustees of the reservation to build a new water park, um, waterfront park in East Boston. Obviously, I it would be remiss if I didn't mention the tragic um, death of Barbara Erickson, who was the CEO of, of that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that collaboration in terms of the vision for their the waterfront? Sure. So I think it's it, there are, our parks uh, is something else that I, I think people don't readily think about Massport uh, when they when they think about us, right? But we we actually own and operate about 37 acres of green space or park space, the Crown Jewel being Piers Park. Yep. Um, and these are commitments we've made to the community uh, to to offer them a, an alternative place to to visit uh, as a way to mitigate some of our impacts. And so um, Piers Park, which we call Piers Park One. Uh, was one of the first major uh, commitments there. We have a commitment uh, to build Pierce Park 2, which was part of the mitigation for Terminal E. Uh, mm -hmm. We are building uh, new gates uh, and expanding Terminal E, and so we committed to do that. And the trustees approached us um, with their One Waterfront initiative to say, we we'd like to think about doing 
uh, an urban waterfront park, um, what do you think? And uh, Barbara had a, had a wonderful vision uh, that she brought forward to us. Uh, and so we've been thrilled uh, to partner with the trustees to bring this unique urban um, um, park to, uh, to the East Boston community and frankly to everyone. Uh, it's gonna be exciting uh, and it's gonna complement uh, both Pierce Park One, which is, which is a passive park, uh, mm -hmm. Pierce Park Two, which we'll create, which will be much more of an active park, and, and the trustees' uh, vision is going to kind of integrate them. So it's it's very exciting. That's great. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing some of the renderings, and and then more importantly, seeing the park and and getting a chance to to visit. It's um, it's remarkable for those of us who grew up in Boston to think about how much this whole the whole city downtown has has changed. Um, you know, over the years with, with the tunnels and the seaport. And again, maybe I'm just dating myself, but thinking about what, what the city is going to look like in, in five, 10, 20 years is, is just remarkable. So. It is. And, and there's so much that's undergoing transformation uh, and that continues. You know, it's one of the things that I think uh, I've been impressed with throughout this crisis is that think, some things have continued to move forward, um, which, you know, ultimately is possible. Yeah, and, and you know you're you're involved in in so much of that first impression for for the non Bostonians, right? For the people who who didn't grow up here, and for the people who are coming to visit, right? They're they're coming through your port, they're coming through your airports, and what they're seeing and what they're describing is now defining their vision of of our community. And so, um, you know, clearly it's more important than just the locals looking out and not seeing parking lots, but seeing parks um, space or we're not seeing traffic on the expressway. It's um, it, it's great. Um, I'm I'm now going to open it up to to questions from our members. We're getting a couple through the chat. Um, I will ask you to turn on your camera and open up your mic for the question. And the first question is is coming from from Jerry Denterline. So Jerry, thanks for for joining us. I think you're probably on mute, but if you unmute yourself, and uh, we'll let you ask the first question of of Lisa, who I think you know. Hi, Jerry. Hi there. Hi, Lisa. Um, thank you for the update. I know it's a real test of your leadership being uh, covering such an important resource at this time. Uh, last time I heard you speak, uh, you spoke to the vac to the um, testing program at the airport and the initiatives um, that were underway on the, in the terminals. And I'd love to know whether those are being uh, taken up and uh, whether you think those might be eclipsed by the vaccine and whether or whether there will continue to be demand on health and wellness strategies at the airport to ensure safety and travel. Sure, so, so um, we did open uh, two testing sites. So we started with the um, testing site in Terminal E uh, and we've recently expanded to Terminal C. Uh, and I'd say they, they are utilized. Um, you know, passenger volume right now is, is a little bit lower. January is always a slower month, but I think coming out of this latest surge, um, you know, travel has, has dropped a little bit, but they, they are utilized. I think they're an important resource uh, and an important offering uh, for us to uh, uh, offer to passengers as part of our, our total health and safety uh, protocol that we've, we've implemented. Um, I do think they will continue to be a part of our portfolio going forward. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the things that particularly, uh, particularly if uh, what is being kicked around right now is, is actually implemented, which, you know, there's talk in DC right now of implementing a requirement for testing for domestic travel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will be candid, uh, that would be devastating. If that goes into effect, that will be devastating mm. for the airlines and it will be devastating for airports. Um, and I know the airlines are very active uh, right now in, in trying to explain why there's just not sufficient capacity, even, even though many airports have what we have in place, there's just not sufficient capacity to do it. Um, and, and it will have a tremendous impact on the limited number of travels, travelers that are, are actually flying right now. But I do think going forward, it's, it's an important part of, of airports portfolio and um, uh, I think we've had discussions with other uh, airlines and other terminals who might want to see it expand just beyond the, the E and C offering. Thank you. That, that that's great. And and um, quick quick question for 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 you, Lisa, and then we're going to turn to Suzanne Bates, who's who's up next. But what sort of changes will we notice when we go to Logan if we haven't been there since March of 2020? What is what are the expectations and, and what are 
what are the visuals that I'm going to see or expect when I go there? And I'm, you know, I'm getting closer and closer to you know, at least thinking about going on a trip at some point. What, what will, what will I see that I haven't seen before? Yeah. So, so we miss all of you and are very excited to, to have everyone back. Um, so, so what's kind of, I think the health and safety protocols that we've implemented are going to be standard going forward. So you can expect, you know, if you start to travel, you're still going to have the mask requirement. We've, we've done a lot around um, social distancing requirements. You're going to see signage everywhere, reminding us of all the things that we've kind of grown accustomed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and though I, those things will, will stay in place along with all of the rigorous cleaning uh, uh, and enhanced cleaning that we're doing, the availability of PP&E to buy. Uh, so some of that, I think, is just kind of baseline. Uh, what we're working towards and some of the things we've implemented and some of the things are in process is really about how do we reimagine uh, the customer journey, the passenger journey. Um, and so some of those things include contactless payments for things, uh, contactless interaction. And so we're in the process of, of thinking about how we influence that, that passenger journey from the point you leave your home to the point when you return home. You don't think about, you think of yourselves as an airline customer, right? You don't really think of yourselves as a Massport customer or a Logan customer. But to the extent that you could, from your phone on a Logan app, book your parking reservation, pay for your parking, uh, order your Starbucks latte and have it delivered to your gate. And if you're not a member of a a club, maybe book a reservation at a club uh, and pay for that in advance. And so when you come back and you return, you never have to have a parking ticket or anything else, all taken care of. Though that's how we're trying to reimagine the passenger journey uh, by trying to make it as contactless and, and seamless as possible for you. Um, some of those things are possible. You can actually order something on your phone and have it delivered to your gate right now. Um, but some of those things are in works, like the parking reservation system, uh, like the e-ticketing uh, reservation system for our Logan Express buses uh, and the Logan app itself, which we hope we'll be able to roll out this spring. It, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that to that vision um, coming to fruition. I, I know that, um, you know, my, my standard sort of expectation is, you know, you get to Logan, however you get there, and then you're in line and maybe you've got sort of pre-check-in or TSA gold or whatever you're doing with global access, but there's a line there. And then there's a line at Starbucks and then you get to your gate or to your lounge. And, and so I'll, I'll look forward to, to all of this. Um, not as much as I'll look forward to, flying into New Orleans or Paris, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to an enhanced experience. Uh, Suzanne Bates is up next. So if, Suzanne, if you would turn your microphone on and um, the floor is yours to ask uh, Lisa a question. Hi, Lisa. Well, I think we're all delighted that you're leading Massport at this really challenging time. Your leadership is obvious and you may have already started to talk about Um, the answers to my question, but you know, you run Massport like a business and businesses everywhere are pivoting right now. Um, They're re-examining their strategies. And I'm just curious about whether the, you know, you're in the middle of it now, but whether it's caused you to um, rethink some of the key strategic initiatives. Absolutely. Um, So, and and it's funny you say pivot because that's what we're talking about with our team right now. So, you know, frankly, we've been in survival mode. Uh, for the the past uh, year. Um, And so we're starting to pivot to reimagining what we do and how we do it. Um, And I would would highlight kind of four focal points for us. So one is the the piece that I just mentioned, uh, which is the customer experience. And and when I say customer experience, it's not just focused on the traveler. If you think about it, airlines are our customers, importers and exporters are our customers, tenants in our real estate portfolio are customers. So how do we think about becoming a more customer centric organization overall? So that, that's kind of key, but obviously a big focus on, on the, the passenger journey and, and how, we, how we improve that. Uh, the second thing is um, we need to adapt our business model um, and we need to diversify our revenue streams. Uh, so there are a couple of aspects of that. One is you know, focusing a little bit more on cargo uh, at our aviation facilities, which we've already started to do. And I think we can all see during the pandemic how important getting the stuff we need is. Um, and so we, we do that through our port and our, our container facility and, and other assets, but also thinking about uh, the opportunities on aviation. But you know, if you, if you think about Massport's business model and our ability to invest in the things we want to do, um, we generated pre-pandemic close to $200 million in parking revenue. And that's a very flexible revenue bucket for us, meaning 
that's the money that we were able to use to invest in Logan Express, HOV initiatives, environmental. So we are having to think about how do we fill that revenue bucket if parking doesn't come back the way we uh, hope it will, or if it evolves to something else. Um, so so we, we are working hard on how do we think about opportunities to monetize the customers in a different way, uh, and also to be thinking about it's a different customer set. Um, and, and the margin that we might make off a business customer is different than a leisure traveler. So, so there's a lot of things that we're, we're trying to think about in terms of adapting the business model um, to be able to continue to do the things we need to do beyond just investing in infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, the, the two other pieces which I talked about earlier is, is how do we advance our DE&I uh, and environmental initiatives. Uh, you know, one of the things that we did early on, so, so we had to cut a billion dollars out of our capital program. Um, uh, just to you know, preserve cash um, in, in this crisis. But one of the things we were very careful about is, is we continue to invest in those strategic uh, projects uh, that we think are important for the Commonwealth's rebound, like the Terminal E uh, project, um, like some of the other uh, uh, projects, like the B2C uh, connector. So we have a project that is connecting Terminal B and Terminal C post-security. Uh, that is a strategic project. We, we started that without knowing that uh, American and JetBlue were going to form an alliance. Uh, and so that project is going to open up a lot of business opportunities for us going forward. So, so we've had to think about a, a couple of things. We've had to think about what do we continue to do that are important strategic investments? And then how do we, how do we rethink what we do and how we do it uh, to make sure we're positioned for success going forward? That's great. Thanks, Thanks Suzanne. Uh, it looks like uh, Andy Arnaud, who, who has used Zoom before and has raised his hand, um, kudos to that. Uh, Andy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Warren. And that's because I couldn't find the chat. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. A, a quick question. I, I know that you, uh, Massport, is a big uh, landowner investor in the Seaport District. And, you know, there's obviously been some press as of late and wondering if you have any thoughts that you can share with us on your outlook for the Seaport going forward. Yeah, so... so let me just rewind a little bit and talk uh, about how our strategy in the Seaport District has evolved over the past 20 years. Uh, so if we all think about what the, the district was before the, the Innovation District arose as we know it today. Um, you know, we were, we were a catalyst uh, for development down there and it was really about the civic agenda. So luring companies like Fidelity and others to come in and make an investment and, and build on, on our property. So the early years were really about around um, the civic agenda. How, how do we bring this, this district to life, making some infrastructure investments uh, like some of the things we did uh, early on around the Silver Line and, and other enabling uh, assets uh, to enable things to, to take off. Fast forward um, and we started to, to realize as the district was, uh, was advancing that our real estate portfolio, we needed to think about the value of that real estate portfolio um, in terms of being able to capture some of the upside ourselves to invest in port infrastructure. So, so we are paying uh, for the modernization of Conley Container Terminal with the exception of the, the funding that the Baker Polito administration has helped us with and, and some federal funding. We are paying for that for those projects um, with money that we're generating uh, from our real estate portfolio. Um, and now as we, we look ahead at some of the developments that uh, are underway in the parcel H, you know, we had to step back and say, okay, typically um, in our real estate portfolio, we do these long-term ground leases. And during this crisis, they've provided an enormous amount of stability uh, from a cash perspective for us. Uh, but we're gonna need to think about how do we do different deals to help us through this current financial challenge we're in. Uh, and so one of the things that we were able to get out of this, this development I talked about on parcel H is a significant upfront cash payment uh, for this development coupled with uh, the ability to still secure rent and, and long-term upside. One of the things that was quite surprising, frankly, we, we launched that RFP for Parcel H prior to the pandemic. Um, and we kind of had to hit the pause button in the middle of the pandemic. And we were unsure whether the, the proposers, the responders to our RFP were still in, right? You know, what, what is, what's gonna be the future of, of the real estate market in the Seaport District? And, and quite frankly, we were astounded uh, that everyone was still fully committed. Uh, and when we asked, uh, would you consider making an upfront payment uh, as a part of your proposal? So adjust your proposal, how significant of a cash payment were you willing to give us? Uh, they were all in. Um, and I think it's a testament 
to how people are thinking uh, about the district in the future. And you see, you see lots of um, smart money coming in and it's continuing to invest. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty confident at this point uh, that the district will, will continue to, uh, to evolve um, um, and, and things will continue to move forward. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Andy, for the question. Uh, again, if, if people have questions, put them in the chat, let us know, raise your hand or just turn your mic off on and, and let us know. But uh, I, I'm, I'm going to can I just jump in for a minute here? I, uh, I want to tell you, we've been very active at the port for a long time. And I just think that the leadership that Lisa has brought to Massport is outstanding. And has encouraged us to want to do much more than we're doing. And uh, I just, she's a real credit to this area in the Commonwealth. And I just wanted to take them all. I speak for my whole family when I say that. And I might have missed it because I had to go off for a moment. But um, what in the area of international, you know, with like El Al, we had and the Emirates, and is there any any activity there that? Um... There is, and, and thank you so much, Mr. Kraft, for those kind words. You, you know, you, you've been a terrific partner of ours, as I said, both on the port side and the airport side. Um, so, so from an international stand front point, um, we still have a few carriers operating at Logan right now. We probably have anywhere from 10 to 20 um, nonstop international flights a day. Um, and the, the thing that the airlines have gotten really good at doing in this crisis is adjusting their schedule almost on a daily or weekly basis. So what we're witnessing is carriers like British, for example, who has, who has been flying throughout this to London in light of the, the new restrictions uh, that have gone into place in, in the UK, they are going to, to suspend that service and make it a cargo only service for a period of time. Uh, same thing with Air Canada, with new restrictions that the Canadian government has put into place. Uh, they are going to suspend their, their Toronto and Montreal services. Um, but, but these carriers are still here. Emirates is still here. Um, El Al had to, to suspend their operations um, during the crisis because there just there isn't, aren't enough international travelers. Um, but I think you know, they are all um, talk to us about the, their long-term plans uh, for Boston Logan. And it's one of the reasons why we continue to proceed with the investments we're making in Terminal E, uh, because long-term, uh, they all talk about their intent to, to, to come back and, and restart some of those services. Just, it's gonna take a little bit longer than I think we might all hope. Thank you. And, and thank you, Mr. Kraft, for, for joining us and for, for the question. Um, are, there, are there other questions? Because I certainly have um, some more of myself, but if anyone else would like to ask a question, the certainly available, but um, Lisa, you ascended to the CEO position reasonably recently, and certainly there wasn't a lot of time between that and then the pandemic hitting. I, I've asked a lot of CEOs this, I'm just sort of curious in terms of your take on leadership during the pandemic, and I know that you're, in, you're at Logan at your office today, but you have a lot of employees that you probably haven't had a chance to meet in person the way you would have liked. How has how sort of your leadership style coincided with 2020 and 2021? Um, uh, great question, and, and obviously always one that's hard to answer um, when, you're, when you're still in the moment. So I guess I would say a couple of things. Uh, so yeah, so I've been in the office every day. 75% um, of our employees uh, are frontline folks, right? You can't run an airport or a seaport yep. from home. Uh, we sent home our, our lawyers, our accountants, our HR people, and so obviously had to figure out um, how we enabled them to still be productive from home. And I think we, we, we did a, a good job with that. Um, but we had to figure out how do we stay open? We never shut down. How do we keep not only our employees safe, but our business partners safe, the traveling public safe throughout? Um, and you know what I would say is I'm very fortunate to have an amazing team uh, of dedicated, talented, and, and seasoned folks. Um, who are problem solvers, right? When you run operations, you love to roll up your sleeves and figure out how do we get the job done. Uh, and so part of it was just kind of pulling and harnessing all of this, the creative energy to, to figure it all out. Uh, the other key thing was communication. Um, I have tried to be as candid as I possibly can be with um, our entire workforce throughout. Um, 
I had, you know, um, laid out some, some clear goals. That was the other thing. Let's lay out some clear goals uh, for the organization. So everyone knows what to focus on. Everyone has their own personal distractions while struggling with a whole bunch of things. But if we can um, preserve cash, preserve health and preserve jobs, uh, we can try and figure out how we uh, laser focus on those three things. Um, and so those were some of the, I would say the, the early things that we did. You know, I, I think many of you are aware we're, we're in a very painful period right now. We're in the middle of reducing our workforce by 25%. Um, and that's been challenging um, and painful. And, you know, it's hard enough to do when it's just a recession. Um, and it's hard, you know, in normal times, if you've, you've over leveraged or you've mismanaged the business, um, it's, it's so much harder when uh, these externalities um, have Kind of forced you to do this thing um and so we've tried to as we've managed through that be as equitable as we possibly can and as fair as we possibly can but also again communicate uh to the extent possible and, and now now that we're kind of making our way through this we are in the pivot point right so we need to pivot from survival mode and pivot to uh the future uh and what our strategy is going to be going forward and and again i use this word a lot, reimagine, reimagine what we do and how we do it. We're not going to go back to the old way of doing things, uh, whether that is how we operate parking garages, yep. um, how we think about the customer journey, you know, so, so, so that's kind of also the message is you have to give your, your workforce something now to think about how do we, how do we focus going forward. That, that's great. And I, I should preface this with, with, um, as a as a non practicing attorney myself, um, kudos on sending the lawyers home at the beginning. That's always a, a, a highly recommended for for all of us. Um, so 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 that's great news, um, Mr. Maresca from Bose, and uh, I I see some good headphones in there. Your hand is up. The the question is up to you. Great. Was I successful in unmuting myself? You were. Okay. Are. Great. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. I find this fascinating. You, you mentioned that 40% of the travelers through Logan are business travelers. And um, I assume that business travelers for the airlines make up a disproportionate share of their profit. So um, if business travel, and based on our experience at Bose, I don't expect business travel to go back to where it was due to the efficacy of video conferencing. We've learned that we can do a lot via video conferencing, not everything, but, but certainly much more than we did in the past. Um, I have to assume, given the you know, high fixed capital expenses of the airlines, that the leisure traveler is going to have to bear the brunt of higher prices in orders. Is that a reasonable assumption? Uh, I think there, there will be some recalibration uh, of the cabin mix. Uh, going forward. Um, so you're right. The stat that I've heard is that the airlines make 75% uh, of their profit off of 10 to 15% uh, of the passengers, particularly on the international front. Um, and so if, if those stats are indeed, you know, universally true, you, they, they have to, to, to do things differently. And so I think from an airline perspective, some, and, and they all, we all know they've taken on enormous amounts of debt. Um, to survive uh, this crisis. Uh, and so they are gonna be hyper-focused on profitability and profitable routes and profitable customers. Um, but they're, they're also in the, the process of trying to figure out what that looks like. I think you know, from a passenger standpoint, it does mean um, more hub flying. So fewer nonstop flights. We've all grown accustomed to, and it's made business travel easier, right? If you, if you don't have to go through a, another destination, you can take that nonstop flight. It makes it much more palatable to fly for that two hour business meeting. But if indeed they're going to have to focus on profitability, it's more profitable to fly through hubs. I think we're, that's something we're all going to have to adapt to uh, in addition to potentially higher prices. Um, it's taken enormous capacity out of the market as well. Um, and so, you know, the, and, and then they don't intend to put all that capacity back, um, you know, in the, in the near term. So a, a lot of changes, I think, coming. Yeah, certainly based on everything that, that we see, you know, in the business, on the business side, but also personally, there's so much pent up demand for after people get vaccines, they just want to, <laughs> they want to go somewhere. So I think the demand will be there on the leisure side. Um, and just from a practical point of view, I, I have to expect that the fares will, will, there'll be a lot of upward pressure on prices. 
Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Bob, for joining us. Good to see you. Wish it was in person. Nice to see you as too. Al as always. Um, I believe Richard Holbrook uh, has a question. So, so Rich, again, I'll, I'll add my course of wel welcome and great to see you and you can unmute yourself and, and ask Lisa your question. Thanks, Warren. And, and Lisa, so obviously this uh, pandemic has had a tremendous impact on smaller businesses. And I know that at the Seaport, at Logan and your other facilities, you have a number of tenants who fall into that category. What, uh, what's been the, the uh, sort of experience of those tenants so far in being able to pay rent, uh, to ask for deferrals? What's been your response to them in, in this time of uh, their need? Great question. And it's one of the things that you know, we said early on. Um, uh, you know, I said to my team, look, you know, we operate an ecosystem. We have the ecosystem of, of Logan Airport. Uh, we have an ecosystem um, in the port. And our health and our ability to emerge from this uh, successfully is dependent upon the overall health of the ecosystem. So when we think about the actions that we're going to need to take uh, to preserve our own financial health, we can't do that in a vacuum. We have to think about the overall ecosystem. Um, and so on the, on the Logan side, that's meant a couple of things. Um, so just to give you a, a flavor of things um, at the airport, we, we typically would have about 150 concessions open across all of our terminals. Um, at the low point, we probably had less than 20 open. Today, we're probably hovering around 60. They kind of, they kind of match their schedules to um, uh, the airline schedule, so it ebbs and flows a little bit. Uh, so still less than half open. So we, we put together a tenant sustainability plan uh, that has provided some, some relief uh, to, to our airport tenants um, and also some relief to the airlines. Um, and then similarly on the seaport side, we, we did the same thing, uh, particularly for our small seafood processors uh, that are tenants. We, we offered up some deferral programs. Uh, we also worked with them uh, to identify potential funding opportunities, right? Some of these guys are small businesses. They had to figure out how to pivot themselves, right? Uh, so, you know, if they had primarily been supplying restaurants, they had to completely change um, who they, they sold to, and many of them have adapted marvelously. So what we tried to do was kind of do some research and groundwork for them. They ultimately had to make the decision, but here are some different programs through the state or, or the feds that you might be able to apply for um, as they were just trying to you know, focus on keeping their employees safe and healthy. So, so we, did, we did think broadly uh, about our different ecosystems and, and did what we could on the, the tenant relief side, as well as just helping them navigate um, various programs. That's great. And, and Rich, thanks for joining us from commencement. It looks like uh, things are going well over your shoulder. I see Dean Boynton uh, there, and I, I see that you're wearing a throwback uh, BC CEO Club vest when we were called the Chief Executive School of Boston. But, but well played, and, and thanks for, uh, for promoting Boston College. We're happy to, to see that. Um, Lisa, let's, let's shift uh, our focus now and, and, and go to our, our lightning round of questions. Uh, we're almost at the top of the hour, and uh, I know that our members enjoy these, and, and hopefully we don't put too much pressure on, on you with some of these questions, but um, what, what was your first paying job? What, what led to bringing you to Massport? What was the first job? Uh, well, I don't know that I can really consider babysitting at a, you know, a buck an hour per kid uh, a first job. Um, my, I guess my first real paying job was as a, a tennis instructor for a kid's summer camp. Is a kind of a real, real job. Well, I, I think you know. I now as a parent, I think that babysitting would would count, especially if, if you say a dollar a kid. If, if there's more than one, then dear God, I think that that's that's good. But so so tennis instructor, how, where was that? Uh, so I grew up in a suburb of San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was not far from from where I lived. It was uh, with a gentleman that I took tennis lessons from, and so he hired high school kids uh, to teach you know little kids tennis in the summer and it was a blast I mean what what how much more fun could you have you get to play tennis you get to work with you know fun little kids it was great yeah and, and during tennis lessons all I can think of is is Tom Hanks and big hitting him over the the fence which is which is something that I, I did but is, is tennis still part of your life now uh, I wish <laughs> all right fair enough fair enough uh what was the last book you read so this is this is kind of an interesting one so my daughter who's a senior in high school 
Mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago said to me, mom, I, I've got this uh, honors book I have to pick. It's I have to pick a sci-fi book and our choices are uh, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, Frankenstein, Brave New World. And I said, Brave New World, you've got to read Brave New yep. World. I love that book. It was awesome. And I went on about the teacher and everything. And, and she said, oh, so what's it about? What did you like? And I said, oh my God, I can't remember a single thing about the book. How, how mortifying is this? So I said, all right. I know I, I remember loving it and it's it's embarrassing that I can't even remember a single thing. If you pick that book, I'll pick it up and read it with you. So I'm I'm kind of in the starting chapter three now uh, as she's reading it. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting given the times we're in as well to be reading them. We'll, we'll, we'll look forward to your book report on, on Mr. Huxley's epic <laughs> piece. It, it's, it's remarkable to think about those books and they're all ones that, you know, that I read in, in, in high school or, or middle school and and to think about, you know, 19, I mean, 1984 specifically, right? Everyone's been talking about it and, and what the future is going to look like. And you, and you now think that that's now, you know, almost 40 years in the past. Um, r remarkable. Yes. Um, what was the last uh, album or song that you, that you intentionally listened to? Not something that appeared, but what, what sort of music did you, do you seek out? Well, so, so I mentioned I, I grew up in a suburb of San Diego and I grew up listening to 91X. Uh, which is an alternative radio station. And mm -hmm. thankfully, we can stream that station now. So that is what uh, we stream in our, in our house and uh, what I listen to on, on my phone. And, and thankfully, my kids like it. Uh, so we don't get into any arguments. So kind of, I kind of do the alternative. Al alternative music. It's, it's mm -hmm. remarkable what, what has turned into being framed as alternative music today versus what it was when I was in you know, <laughs> college in the 80s, right? It's, it's you know. It's very, it's, yeah. Yeah, you know, if you go back and you think about like Susie and the Banshees, Dead yeah. Milkmen, all of those kinds of like bands, and yep. it's very different today. Yes. Yeah, lo locally we had WFNX, which was a great station for, for a while. Um, now I'm always um, reminded about my musical taste and, and what counts as classic or alternative when I'm on the Peloton and they talk about classic rock and they pull something from like 2005 and I just <laughs> want to get off the bike and call it a day. But, um, but good. That's that, that's a, a good memory. And, it, and the streaming is remarkable i've got um a, a favorite station down in new orleans wwoz that does jazz and blues and the ability to sort of listen to that now you know in your kitchen on your 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 bluetooth bose speakers and and everything else is really um it, it stays connected so you so so do you when you listen are you are you just pining for the weather reports from san diego now yeah well if, okay. if i don't get them from 91x i hear it from my family yeah. Oh, gee, you know, it's, it's about 75 degrees and we're, we're headed outside. What are you guys doing? Yeah, it's <laughs> we're heading Diego. out to the yeah. shovel, right? Yeah. When, when did you come to Boston? So we moved here uh, in the fall of 99. Okay. Um, and, you know, we love it. We thought we'd go back, but, but I think, you know, my husband and I love New England. We thought it was a great place to raise our children and we have no intention of going back. Excellent. Although, although, you know, watching the snow fall outside, you think, well, 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 maybe a visit would be nice, right? Yeah, well, maybe, you know, maybe we'll have to, you know, take a vacation in January and February as we get yeah. older to, to escape some of it. But oh. um, there's, we think it's wonderful here. We don't mind shoveling, probably because we didn't grow up doing it. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, in, in San Diego, what a place. Um, fav favorite guilty food? Um, homemade chocolate chip cookies. That's a good call. That's, that's a good call. Do you have any for us or anything, you know, that even, have you, have you spent more time sort of making fun stuff in the kitchen? I know that, that, you know, we've been locked down. And so we've been, my, my family and I've been spending more time in the kitchen. Uh, so alas, I have not, um, you know, I think just because I've, I've been here uh, yep. so much, um, but I do, I do tinker, I do bake. So if I, and I, I tinker with the chocolate chip cookie recipe and my kids are always like, oh, so what are you going to do to it this time? Usually they're they're pretty happy, so no complaints. Good. That's 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 a good um, favorite food, and it certainly brings all sorts of memories to to me as I as I think about my you know my lunch waiting for me. Um, what does I I've, I've got a question. This is how would you like to be remembered, and it doesn't seem really appropriate necessarily. But what is it that how would you like your tenure at Massport to rem be remembered in? you know, 20 years when, when you've gone back to surfing in, in San Diego, listen to your alternative music, eating your chocolate chip cookies, how, how would you like Massport to be remembered under your tenure? You know, I think, um, 
I guess I would like to, depending upon how long my tenure is, right? So, mm -hmm. so if we assume it's it's kind of this this five year time frame, um, I I guess I would hope that you could look back and say that uh, the decisions we made under my tenure um, created a a sustainable financial model for the authority to to endure uh, through this crisis because that's ultimately right. We need these assets to be successful long term, and so if we can look back and say we made the right decisions, we invested strategically. Uh, to position this place well for the, the recovery and we help the Commonwealth's recovery, um, I'd be I'd be quite satisfied with that. That's that's great. And, and from the sounds of, of the people on this call who who matter and who are customers of, of yours, it sounds like you're heading in the direct, right direction. And certainly it, it echoes the mission of Massport that we led off this conversation with, right? Connecting Boston and New England to the world and re-energizing and reinstituting that that relationship and those those paths are, are so critically important. So um, we're we're all here to make sure that you're successful. So um, that's that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn now to our to our last question. It's something that we've instituted since um, we went virtual, and and our members keep sending me emails saying they enjoy it, and I've I've given you a heads up that it was coming. Um, but I ask all of our guests to share a message of hope something that we can all leave today's uh, session with, uh, with a little bit of optimism, something that we can stick in our hat. It could be a quote, it can be a hope, but uh, Lisa, share with us your message of hope to our members. Sure, so, um, you know, when, when, I, when I think about this crisis and I, I reflect back on, on Massport's history, I actually wasn't here, I didn't work for Massport at 9-11, but I think even despite the fact that you know we're, our business activity is, is lower now than it was then, I think most people here would say 9-11 was Massport's darkest days. Um, and we recovered from that. Uh, the Great Recession hit Logan hard and we recovered from that. Um, and I think you know when I think about Massport and Logan and then I just think about us as a people, um, you know, we are resilient um, and um, you know, despite everything that's happening in our in our country and that has happened, um, you know, I, I recognize that the U.S. is not perfect. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to make this uh, place work for everyone. Uh, but I still firmly believe that there is no place on this globe that I would rather be uh, than right here in the U.S. Uh, to figure out how we all navigate uh, through this crisis, um, because we have always risen to the occasion in this country. Um, and whether you want to chalk it up to American resolve, American ingenuity, today we call it resilience, um, we have always found a way. Um, and so to me, there is no better place to find a way through all of this than being right here in the U.S. And within the U.S., I think there is no better place, no place I'd rather be than right here in the Commonwealth and in Boston. And when I look around at the investment that is continuing, uh, when I look at how engaged our business community is and how engaged our civic leaders are, um, I am incredibly hopeful and confident uh, that we will emerge from this thing better and stronger. Uh, so that, I think, is, is the message of hope that, that I, would, I would leave you with. Well, thank you for that message. That's fantastic. And, um, you know, that, that the theme of resiliency is something that comes up a lot. And I think that we've all had to deal with it personally, professionally. Um, as our country has gone through change in the last several years and thinking about the future is just is, is helpful. And, and clearly when you talk about no place you'd rather be both in the country and, and in this region and city, um, you've made it clear, anyone who leaves San Diego to come to Boston um, to, to do what you've done and to take the leadership role with Massport, uh, you don't have to convince me that, that your, your hope is genuine and your statement is, is true. So. So thank you again of, of that message of hope. Um, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I very much enjoyed our, our conversation today and really appreciate the, the connection with all of you. I thank you for the, the really thoughtful questions and uh, obviously look forward to, to you all traveling uh, uh, through our facilities again. And, and again, our goal is to deliver, to, to meet your expectations. So um, again, thank you, Warren, for, for this opportunity. That's, that's wonderful and we'll look forward to to vision you at Massport. We'll look forward to gathering together as a, as a community and as an organization uh, at the Boston Harbor Hotel as soon as we possibly can. Um, I certainly wanna thank all of our members for joining us.
today. We had a great and robust crowd. Uh, thank you to the members of my board of governors. Uh, I saw many of you on there, if I missed any of you, but, but Carol Fulp and Diane Hessen and Robert Kraft and Marianne Harrison, um, specifically, thank you for joining us. Um, and and I, I'm really looking forward to the future. I do have two dates that I'll announce on this call. You'll be getting an email in the next couple of days um, as we wrap up some of the logistics, but um, our next event will be on March 8th when we host Abbott Labs CEO, Robert Ford, who happens to be a Boston College alum. Uh, but Abbott Labs is making some incredible um, advancements uh, in general, but certainly with, with COVID and pandemic. So he'll be joining us on March 8th. And then April 5th, we have an interesting event. We're gonna be doing a forum on diversity and inclusion. This is based on PWC's CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. And so on April 5th, we will have a panel discussion and I'll be joined by Tim Ryan, who is the chairman of the US of PwC, Wright Lasseter III, CEO, president and CEO of the Henry Ford Health System, and then Jenny Johnson, president and CEO of Franklin Templeton. So that will be on April 5th. Again, you'll all get an email uh, with, in, uh, with invitations to attend these events, um, but that's what our future holds for us at the Boston College Chief Executives Club. But again, on behalf of Boston College, the Carroll School of Management, and our membership. Lisa, thank you so much for your time. Everybody stay safe, happy shoveling, uh, and stay connected. Take care. Thank you.